please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. And let me pray for our time in God's word together. Father, we do praise and worship you that you are a God that is mighty to save. And Father, we recognize that there are many other claims of people and groups and religious philosophies that have claimed salvation. But Lord, we thank you that you not only have made that claim, but you have demonstrated your mighty power, your ability, your sufficiency to save us in raising Jesus from the dead. Father, we thank you that we are not left to one option of blind faith among many others, but Lord, we, you've given us the proof of our faith, the proof of our salvation, the proof that our faith is not in vain, that we are not most of all to be pitied because we have a Savior who has risen. We have a living Savior that because of what he's done and and, and that, that we have salvation. So, Father, we pray that you would glorify your Son this morning, that you would open our eyes and incline our hearts to you. Help us to glory in this text. I know, Lord, that so many of us have heard this story and read this account so many times. But, Lord, give us eyes to see this anew. Give us hearts to be amazed with the faith of a child. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you heard the fictitious story about the global tour of religious holy sites? The tour guide stopped in India where Gautama Buddha was cremated and memorialized. And the tour guide said, this is a holy site where the founder of Buddhism is enshrined. So please be quiet and keep your voices at a hush. Then the tour went to Mecca to the tomb of Muhammad. And the tour guide said, this is a holy site where the founder of of Islam is buried, so please be quiet and keep your voices at a hush. Then they went to Jerusalem, to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, on the rock quarry of tombs where Jesus had been buried, and the tour guide said, this is where Jesus' body was buried after his crucifixion. And a Christian in the tour group said, but he isn't here anymore. He rose from the dead. There's nothing there, so you can be as loud as you want. As I said, that's a fictitious story, but it makes a very non-fictitious point. See, all of Christianity is based on this claim, the historical claim that Jesus rose from the dead. Unlike the founders of every other world religion who died and whose, whose burial sites and shrines you can visit, Christianity is based on Jesus Christ's resurrection and the conquering of death for us. That's why from the earliest times of Christianity, various Christians would greet each other with the saying of, he has risen, and people would respond, let let, let me practice that again, he has risen. risen You're almost there, he has risen. risen This is what we get to talk about this morning. This is the glorious climax of Matthew's gospel. So in fact, throughout the the, the, just to make sure you don't lose sight of how glorious this is and our attention's focused, that throughout the, the, the service, if I say, he has risen, yes. that's right. Because we want it, that's the, the takeaway. It's a very simple sermon. That this is the point, and this is the point that changes everything for us. As Don read earlier from 1 Corinthians 15, all of Christianity rises or falls based on if Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Paul said, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, it would be more beneficial for you to leave right now and to go home and watch football. It would be better for your souls than to listen to the vain musings of a dead liar who claimed he would rise again. If Jesus never rose from the dead, Paul says, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But if Christ did rise from the dead, which we'll see every historical evidence points to the fact that he did, then Jesus is the Son of God that he claimed to be. Then your status 
before the God of the universe, the forgiveness of your sins, the, the, your eternal destiny forever is dependent on what you do with Jesus Christ. So everything in our life today and our future to come comes down to that crucially critical question. Did Jesus rise from the dead? And if so, what does his resurrection mean for you and for me? These two questions are the ones that Matthew is addressing in Matthew chapter 28, 1 through 10. This is the climax of Matthew's gospel. That as, as we followed through the life of Jesus, that for 20 chapters we see the most glorious, wonderful life ever to have been lived. And we followed Jesus, he healed the sick, and we followed through Jesus, he, he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the forgiveness of sins. And then for seven chapters, Matthew slows the pace of his story down. 30 years and 20 chapters, and then seven chapters for one week as we walk through the Passion Week and we see Jesus' crucifixion and burial. And then we get this one last chapter in the gospel, the shortest chapter of the gospel. It's a very simple chapter because the point is very clear that Jesus is no longer dead. He is alive. It is not a hoax. Jesus is alive and triumphing over history. So let's look at this morning and how Jesus answers these questions. First, our question, did Jesus rise from the dead? Matthew starts by showing us the, before he gets into the proof, he wants to show us the amazing nature. He wants us to be amazed at the resurrection. Look at verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. A very simple start here. Matthew tells us it's now after the Sabbath. The Jewish Sabbath was from Friday evening to Saturday evening, and now Matthew 28 takes place on Sunday morning. And, and on Friday, Jesus had died on the cross, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he bore our sin and the punishment we deserve. And as Pastor Bob pointed out in his sermon last week, then Jesus was buried according to the scriptures to show he was dead for three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And now at first light on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary go to see Jesus' tomb. They're Matthew, or Mark and Luke tell us that they're bringing spices to complete the burial that was done in haste on Friday. You know, it's interesting. Most people, as they read that and commentaries that, that are about this verse, they, they focus on the idea that, the idea that, 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 that it was women, it was these women who, who witnessed the resurrection, who witnessed Christ's resurrection first, guarantees that the story wasn't fabricated. And the argument is that typically women in the first century uh, oftentimes were not considered credible legal witnesses. So if Matthew and, and Mark and Luke and John were going to make up this story, they, they certainly would not have used the Marys for their witnesses. They would have made up some other people that were more credible witnesses to the resurrection. And all that's true. It's actually an important proof of the resurrection, of being historical. That's not Matthew's point. We can get sidetracked with what's interesting and what's historically, apologetically helpful, but not what's the point. Look there. Look at these women. These were the only women that were at the cross, the only followers of Jesus that stayed with him at the cross. These were the women who stayed with Jesus through the burial and now the first ones to the tomb on Sunday morning. What's Matthew's point here? His point is not, look, this is my evidence for the resurrection. It is evidence, but... That's not his evidence. He's not saying, see, they're not legally credible, and so that's, that's why I'm putting it here. That's not his point. See, most commentators focus on what the women are not, right? That's what we often hear. Here's what the women are not. But Matthew focuses on what the women are. He shows how faithful they are. He shows that they are faithful and courageous followers of Jesus. And these women are a picture of the church to come, where every person, both male and female, are credible and important members of Christ's body. That every member of Christ's body, both male and female, are called to be faithful servants. Every member of Christ's body are called to be credible witnesses to the gospel. But all that's just the lead up to what Matthew's really getting to, right? Because look at verse 2, where he starts by saying, Behold! We want to pay attention when, when Matthew puts that. Why did he put behold? There's, he's trying to get us to behold something, Right? It's, it's, it's Matthew's ways of bolding and underlying and italicizing and highlighting what's about to happen. Look at verses 2 through 4. And behold, there was a great earthquake, 
For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. So Matthew says, behold, look, just don't freeze by this. Pay attention to this scene at the tomb. There's this earthquake. It's not just any earthquake. It's a heavenly earthquake. Because look what Matthew says there in verse 2. There was a great earthquake. What's the next little word you got there? Four. You guys see that? That's an important word. Four. Here's the reason for the earthquake. It's the appearance of God's messenger. Matthew doesn't say if it's four in the sense that the angel used an earthquake or God used an earthquake with the angel to roll away the stone or the earthquake announced the angel's presence. Matthew doesn't say, but Matthew's saying that this earthquake is, is the sign that this, this, this is a divine act. This is something that God is doing here. God is at work. And Matthew tells us this angel had this appearance like lightning. He was impressively glorious, a heavenly figure with clothes as white as snow as an angel of God. But more important than what the angel looks like, he wants us to see what the angel did. He wants us to visualize this, that he comes down and he rolls back the stone. Not to let the Messiah escape, right? Jesus had already risen and and, and left. He didn't need the the angel to roll away the stone for the Messiah to get out. He needed to roll away the stone. Why? To let the witnesses come in, to prove what had already been done. And I love this. And, 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 and Matthew emphasizes with the verbs here. He, he does all this, and then he sits. He jumps up on top, and he just sits down on this giant rock. I, I just, I, I wish there was more detail, because I can just imagine what this is like. Right? Can you imagine this angel just chilling on top of that rock? And he's saying, yeah, you don't need that anymore. He's gone. Well, yeah, yeah, come on in. I, I, I took care of that for you. Check it out. Right? He's just, he's just sitting there. And look at the response that caused. The guards, these were battle-trained Roman soldiers, remember? They were repelled to, or prepared to repel any attempt to get into the tomb, but they weren't pre- prepared for this. They were terrified at what happened. I mean, look at Matthew's description. It didn't just say, Matthew could have said, and the guards were afraid. But it was more than that. He said, for fear of the angel caused them to tremble, to be terrified. But there's more than that. He goes on. He doubles down on this and says, they were in such terror, they were completely paralyzed like someone who was dead. It's, it's like, guys, guys, remember the old Scooby-Doo cartoons where when Scooby and Shaggy saw the ghost and they're like, Ding! right? And they're completely like petrified, like rigor mortis had set in, right? And you could like touch them. It's like, Meow. right? That's, that's what's, I mean, they're, 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 but this isn't Scooby-Doo cartoon. These guys, there's, there, there were, completely petrified of what had happened. Now, let me pause for a second. I want to ask a question. Why did Matthew tell the story of Jesus' resurrection like this? And what I mean is, he could have said it a different way, couldn't he? He could have said, on the first day of the week, Jesus rose from the dead and walked through the walls of the tomb. He could have said that. But look, there's not even Jesus here. Jesus doesn't come for a couple verses. I mean, it's clear that what had happened from the earthquake and the angel and the response of the guards, but why start the story this way? I wrestled with that this week. Why start it this way? Why this and not that? Here's my suggestion, because Matthew's a good storyteller. Right? He, he doesn't just want us to know the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. We're not, as Christians, we're not just people who know facts about Jesus and facts that he rose from the dead. We are people who have experienced the amazement of who Jesus is and what he did. He wants us to experience the same feeling that these women experienced when they came to the tomb. He wants us to visualize this. He wants us to see it. He wants us to to be able to imagine that you're going to that tomb. You're, you're, You're going to see a dead and buried Jesus that you thought was the hope of Israel. And as you're walking up, you feel that giant earthquake under your feet. And you're wondering, what is going on? And you hurry to the tomb. And and when you get to the tomb, you're blinded by this glorious angel. And he's sitting on top of the rock that you were thinking, how am I going to roll that away? And next to him are just a side note, these two Scooby-Doo-style guards that are standing with their mouths agape. And you're just, I mean, what would your reaction be? If you were there, 
Remember, this is not Scooby-Doo. This is real life. If that was you and you were there, what would your reaction be? Wow. What happened? Right? Wouldn't your reaction be wonder and amazement? And that's Matthew's point. That, that we don't just need to know the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. We need, to, we need to cultivate that wonder and amazement in our hearts that this is the most wondrous and amazing and significant event in all of history. It is the appropriate response to what Matthew is describing is only wonder and amazement. It reminds me when last year I was reading uh, C.S. Lewis's Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe to, to my son Isaac. And, and he, he loved the Pevensey children, and he loved Mr. Beaver, especially he thought it was funny that he didn't like Bath Day. Um, and, and, but he especially was amazed at the great lion, Aslan. And when it, we got to the scene in the book where Aslan was killed by the white witch, he was a little upset. And I wanted to just say, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry, Aslan's okay. As a parent, you want to do that, right? But it took everything, I, I couldn't do that because I wanted him to accept experience the fullness of what happened next when c.s lewis writes for a moment they susan and lucy didn't see the important thing then they did the stone table was broken in two pieces by a great crack and ran down it from end to end and there was no aslan who's done it cried susan what does it mean is it more magic yes said a great voice behind their backs it is more magic they looked around there, shining in the sunlight, larger than they had seen him before, shaking his mane, stood Aslan himself. I remember when I read those lines, I could visibly see the excitement in my son's body, right? There's times when he gets so excited, you can visibly see it, right? What? 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 He's alive! That's what Matthew wants us to feel. That's what Matthew wants us to see. But it's not a fictional Narnian lion. This is a historical event of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And as Christians, we need to ask, are we amazed? Or have we just jumped and says, I know that fact, and we've lost that amazement. As I was a youth pastor here, I loved storing. I showed the, the movie about every other year called Etau. It's about the Mark and Gloria Zook, the Zook uh, couple, who were missionaries in Papua New Guinea. And the Zooks took a different evangelistic strategy as they went to this tribe of the Mook people. What they did, instead of just sharing the gospel, they started from Genesis and they told the stories of the Bible all the way through, story by story by story. And they, they waited to get to Jesus. They showed the pictures of Jesus, but they waited to the gospel until they got to Jesus. And, 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 and the Mook people fell in love with these stories and they fell in love with this Jesus. And then when it finally came time for Jesus to be crucified, they were broken. They were distraught. They thought surely this Jesus would escape. After all he did, he could just get out of it. But he died. They were, they were so upset. And then Mark shared the story of Jesus being raised from the dead. And this, this village was, was just energized, was excited. And person after person in this village started standing up. And one by one, they shared a testimony of how they were trusting in Jesus Christ. They were going to be a follower of Jesus Christ who paid for their sins. They would be a follower of Jesus Christ. And the rest of the village would yell out, Etau, Etau. It is true. It is good. And this entire village of 310 people, who were normally, Mark says, a restrained people, were so amazed at, what, at this Jesus, they just burst out and yelling and dancing and celebrating that Jesus is alive. They, they, they went back to the village who reenacted the scene. It's, it's an incredible scene if you ever see it. But it's the only reaction that makes sense to, it, to understand what does it mean that Jesus is alive is amazement. So let me ask you, brothers and sisters in Christ, are you still amazed? Or have we moved on to other things? Are we still excited about Jesus being raised from the dead, or have we gotten just excited about other stuff? We need to return to that scene on that Sunday morning and recapture that amazement. Do you lack joy in your Christian life? Do you lack amazement in your Christian life? We need to remember that our, our feelings follow fact. Our, our hearts are going to follow our heads. So let me ask, when's the last time you have meditated deeply and thought deeply about the resurrection? 
We want to think deeply about the cross and what Christ did for us. But as my dear brother John Paul Avent reminded me in a study we did, we need to be thinking deeply about the resurrection as well. So when is the last time you've sat at the foot of the cross? Or at the foot, at the, at the, there you go. We've sat at the empty tomb and thought on it and pondered it until you feel that amazement that Matthew is trying to give you. That's one of the reasons we gather, right? As I, as I said during communion, that we gather on the first day of the week not just a tradition, because Jesus Christ rose on the very first day of the week. Our gathering today is a reminder to us of why we're here, is that Jesus rose from the dead. It's interesting that we probably would never skip church if there was a football game on Easter, right? Easter, the Easter Sunday, or take a vacation if it was Easter Sunday and take that as our travel day. But as I said, every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every Sunday is the day that we would come and be amazed once again at our risen Savior. So did Jesus rise from the dead? This amazing scene shows that he did. It shows that we should be amazed at that. But then Matthew goes on to show us there's also historical proof that this occurred. Look at verses 5 and 6 with me. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, See the place where he lay. So it wasn't just the guards who were afraid. Clearly, the women had some fear along with their amazement. They're wondering, what happened to Jesus? They were seeking the crucified Jesus. But the angel sought to bring clarity of the, to their fears. He's saying, there is no crucified Jesus here. Because why? Here's the verse. For he has risen. That, that's what the angel said. I'm just reading the Bible, right? That's what happened. It happened, and I love he said, it's just as he said. You shouldn't be surprised at this. Jesus said this would happen throughout Jesus' ministry again and again. In, in Matthew 16, Matthew 17, and the other Gospels as well, he promised that after he was killed, he would be raised again. In fact, in, in our family devotional times, after dinner, we, we, I read just a little section of Matthew. We're going through the book of Matthew, and sometimes even just a half paragraph. And it's very simple. It's not just because I'm a pastor I can do it, but anyone really can do it. I just read what's there, and I try to explain it so that my four-year-old can understand, which sometimes is kind of challenging. But it doesn't take a seminary degree to do, right? So we're reading through Matthew, and we got to Matthew 12, 38 through 40, where the Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign, right? And so I explained that to my son. They're asking for Jesus to prove who he is. And Jesus says that the only sign they will get is the sign of Jonah, right? That just as Jonah was in the fish three days, so Jesus would be in the fish, or in the fish, in the earth for three days. And that's what PB, Pastor Bob, covered last week. That, that, that's why Jesus' burial was important. But the story of Jonah implies something more, right? I asked my son, did Jonah stay in the fish? No. That's right. He said no just now. Um, what happened to Jonah? The fish spit him out. That's right. He didn't stay in the fish. He got out. He he went on. And that's that's what Jesus is saying. Here is the sign. Here is the proof to your family and to my family. Here is the proof to the Pharisees and to our friends that Jesus is who he said he is, the resurrection. That's that's the proof for us. That's just as he said. And to prove that that's all true, the angel's like, come on in. Come check it out. He invites him into the tomb. That's where he was laying, right? You were there when Joseph put him in. He's not there. He has risen. And and what a privilege for these these faithful women that God has given them to be the first to witness the signs of the resurrection. But as Uncle Ben says, great privilege brings great responsibility. And so look at verse 7, where the angel then says, Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, There you will see him. See, I have told you. As witnesses to the resurrection, they had a responsibility now, a new mission to go and tell others. Specifically here, they're supposed to go and find Jesus' disciples. That's probably the 11. And tell them that Jesus has risen from the dead and that his disciples are going to get to see him too, as Jesus had previously said when they go to Galilee. So there's no longer any reason to stay in the tomb. It's empty. It's time to go. It's time to go and tell. That's the new picture, right? It's not come and see, it's go and tell. 
In fact, back to my comical story I started my sermon with about the different religious sites and burial sites that you can visit, that for, for a couple hundred years, we didn't even care where Jesus, Christians didn't care where Jesus' burial site was. It wasn't until about 300 A.D. that Constantine's mother made a pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem and then found out from the historical accounts and people were saying where it was that Christians said, we're not going to go to the tomb because there's nothing there. There's no shrines. There's no churches. There's no memorials because the empty tomb is not the point of our worship. Jesus is the point of our worship, and he's alive. All that the, histor- the, 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 the tomb is, what Matthew's showing us that it is, is historical proof. All it is is proof that Jesus has risen from the dead. That's the point. That's it's the historical proof. I, and I like what Pastor David Platt says about this. He says that most people, when they talk about these things of Christianity, they, they think that the, the burden of proof is exclusively on Christians to give the evidence for the resurrection. But Platt would say that's not entirely true, and I would agree with him. He says that there is a burden of proof that as Christians, we should present the evidence for Christ and the resurrection. But there's also a burden of proof on unbelievers as well. And and Platt's right. You see that there are three historical facts that are agreed upon by Christians and by non-Christians that have to be explained by everybody. First, there's this, what Matthew's showing us, the empty tomb. You see, there's, not almost, there's, there's almost no credible person who doesn't believe that Jesus was an actual person, that he lived, and that he was killed by the Romans, and he was buried. Everyone agreed. And there's also almost no credible person who would say that, that the tomb was empty. Why? Because if the tomb was not empty, the Jews and the Romans who were trying to crush this new Christian movement, they would have had a really easy time, Right? If all these Christians are evangelizing and sharing with people that Jesus had risen from the dead and the Jews and the Romans wanted to stop this, what would they do? Here's the body, right? It's a lie. But they couldn't do that because there was no body. The tomb was empty. Second of all, the other evidence is the resurrection appearances, which we're going to see a little later in Matthew. And even skeptics have to historically admit there was something that happened. There was some sort of experience. If if 1 Corinthians 15 says that 500 people had this experience and they were witnesses that you could go and talk to about it, there's something that happened. There's also a third evidence of a radically changed church, that the disciples went from cowering in a room to being willing to die for this message that Jesus had risen from the dead, that all except one of them were eventually martyred because of that message. These are historical proofs that everyone agrees on. They may, say, they may take those differently, but they agree on those three things. So you see, if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, there is a burden of proof that you have to come up with a more plausible explanation that would explain what we know is historical fact. In fact, if you're visiting with us this, us this morning and you're a non-Christian, I want to say welcome. I want to take a moment and say welcome that we are so glad that you are here this morning. This is a great morning to be here. This is, this is the best section of the entire gospel of Matthew is the Jesus, Jesus' resurrection. But I want you to ask yourself, what is the most plausible explanation for the historical evidence? What explains this? I, 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 just, I want to give you briefly some different ideas. I did this more in depth at my Easter sermon this last year, but just think about some of the other explanations that are out there. Some people have the, what's called the wrong tomb theory. They think the women got mixed up and they just were confused in their grief and they went to the wrong tomb and they mistake the, this angel for a gardener. Well, there's historical problems with that, right? First of all, the body's still in the tomb. Second of all, there's the idea that the disciples stole the body. Pastor Bob's going to cover that in Matthew next week, that the, the religious leadership, the Jewish leadership came up with that. But there's still a problem when you look at the, the disciples. They'd be willing to be martyred for this lie. And it, just, it makes no historical sense. It doesn't account for the historical evidence. It also doesn't account for the resurrection appearances. There's the hallucination theory, that the idea that, that these disciples of Jesus had just this hallucination. They had some bad Taco Bell, and, and they, they're having these bad hallucinations of Jesus, but he didn't really rise from the dead. Again, what's the problem historically? The body's still there, right? And 500 people don't have the same hallucination at the same time. And then there's the swoon theory. That's the theory that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just 
fainted from exhaustion and loss of blood. He just kind of swooned over, right? And then everyone thought he was dead, but when he was later put in that cold tomb, by the way, mummified basically with spices and wrapping, but when he was put in the cold tomb, the cold air revived him, and he somehow got out of the tomb and convinced people he was risen from the dead. Um, there are multiple problems here. In addition of the Roman soldiers that were guarding uh, the tomb, I like what John Stott, Pastor John Stott says about the problems with this theory. He's a little more, more snarky than I am, so I'll read his words. Quote, Are we then seriously to believe that Jesus was all the time only in a swoon? That after the rigors and pains of trial, mocking, mockery, flogging, crucifixion, he could survive 36 hours in a stone sepulcher with neither warmth nor food nor the tending of his wounds, and that he would rally sufficiently to perform the superhuman feat of shifting the boulder from the mouth of the tomb and that doing all that without disturbing the Roman guard. Then, weak and sickly and hungry, Jesus could appear to the disciples and give them the impression, impression that he had vanquished death. Unquote. You see, none of the explanations out there can account for the historical facts, which leaves only one explanation, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And let me tell you something else. If you are here and you struggle with that idea, I, I just don't know what you're saying. I just don't know if I can believe in this idea of resurrection. Even if you're struggling if it's true, you should want it to be true, right? Because Jesus' resurrection brings a hope for your resurrection as well. It brings a hope that there is something after death, that eternal life is possible for you. But there's something even beyond that. It's interesting that our secular society so wants to deny anything about the, they, they want to deny anything about the resurrection, anything about eternal life, anything about the life to come, and yet that undercuts the deepest passions of our society. The passion for justice, the passion that this life means something. I, I like what T Pastor Tim Keller writes. He says this. He says, most people care deeply about justice issues like the poor and alleviating hunger and disease and caring for the environment. But many people be also believe that the material world was just an accident and that after we're done, we just disappear and, and, and that everything's going to eventually just burn up. And so you get discouraged why people don't do more for these issues. But you don't realize that without the hope of a resurrection, without the hope of a life to come, it undermines any motivation you have to make the world a better place. Right? Why sacrifice for the needs of others if in the end it makes no difference? If in the end we're just going to all burn up and all just disappear into nothing, why spend your life for these issues of justice. In fact, that's why Immanuel Kant, even though he didn't believe in the Bible and believe in Jesus, he said there must be a life to come, otherwise what we do here does not matter. And Keller says, however, if the resurrection of Jesus happened, that means first there's infinite hope, but there's also reason then to pour ourselves out for others. So if you, if you care about yourself and you care about the hope for eternity and you care about justice, then we care about Jesus rising from the dead. My only question that remains is, what will you do with this resurrected Savior? My non-Christian friend, how will you respond to Jesus Christ? The, the, the evidence there that he rose from the dead, but it's also why all this happened, that, that he came, to first of all, to die for us, to die in our place for our sins. Sin is another way of saying rebellion. You see, that it's the idea that, that, that God created us and we rebelled against him. We didn't worship God. We didn't honor God. We, we worshiped and honored ourselves. We did what we want to do. We, we did it the opposite of what is honoring and worshiping to God. We have sinned and committed treason against the God of the universe. But God loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to go to the cross to pay for that treason, to pay for our sin. That's why he died. But he didn't just die. He rose from the dead to show that this is true, to show that we can have forgiveness of our sins, to show that we can be reconciled to God, to show that we can have eternal life with him if we would repent of our sins and place our trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you would like to know more about this Jesus, we would love to tell you more. We don't want to force anything on you. We, we want to answer your questions, and we want to help you, we want to help you to get to know this Jesus and what he has done for you. 
So if you're interested, please don't leave today without talking to someone. To talk to the person who brought you to church. Talk to any member of our church. I'll be at the back of the sanctuary as well after the service. I'd love to talk to you more about this Jesus and how you can have your sins forgiven and have eternal life in him. And all of that really is that focus on what does that mean, right? What does that mean for us? Which leads to the next question. Our last question is, what does Jesus' resurrection mean for me? Look at verse 8. So, Matthew says, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Matthew tells us that the women went quickly to do exactly what the angel told them to do, and they ran. They probably ran as fast as they, they humanly could, right? Because they were so excited. They, they ran with fear after witnessing what God had just done. They, they ran with joy. They're just trying to wrap their heads around the idea that Jesus is alive. And they ran with purpose to spread this good news to the 11 disciples that Jesus is alive and they're going to see him too when they go to Galilee. But before they could even finish their task, Matthew says again in verse 9, Behold, pay attention, look what happens next. Verse 9, And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Matthew's description is so very simple, isn't it? I wish there was some complications in the Greek I could bring out for you, but it's very simple. Jesus comes and meets them and says, hey there. He comes up and says, hello. Uh, Just an ordinary greeting. Now, the greeting may have been ordinary. It may be simple, but there is nothing ordinary and simple about what is really going on here, right? I mean, just think think about these two women. Think about what it is that they are standing, finding themselves face to face with the man who they had just watched die days before, who they had seen buried in the tomb. And now he's in front of them saying, hey, how's it going? I mean, just imagine you're them. There are no words to describe. There's no words Matthew could have used to describe just what is going on here, how truly awesome this must have been. I mean, just think about it. Just, just think about what it would be to behold the Savior with your own eyes. To watch him standing there in front of you. A- imagine what it is to hear his voice with your own ears. To show it's not just a, your eyes playing a trick on you. Imagine what it is to feel him with your own hands. To show this is not a ghost, it's not an illusion. He has really risen. It, it, it's not a, a, a to know it's between, beyond a shadow of a doubt, a doubt that he has risen. That's what they're experiencing. And then look at their response. They grasped his feet, meaning they had first knelt to the ground, and they worshipped him. Remember, these were faithful Jewish women. They knew from the Old Testament that no one, no one, no person, no thing, no anything is to be worshipped except God. Yahweh alone is worthy of worship. That's very clear in the Old Testament. But because of the resurrection, they now realize that Jesus is no mere person. He's no mere anyone. Jesus was and is God. He is Yahweh. He is the I am, and that Jesus is worthy of all worship and honor and praise. And notice one more thing. Notice what's not here. Notice, does Jesus stop them like we've seen angels do at other parts of the Bible? Oh, don't worship me. Only God is worthy of being worshiped. Does he say that? No. He accepts their worship. They're worshiping him as God, and he is acknowledging that he is God by accepting their worship. There are people today who would say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, John did, but John was written later. John doesn't count. Matthew never says that Jesus is God. Go to Matthew 28. For for a Jewish person, it is blasphemy to receive worship as God. In fact, then look at Jesus' response finally in verse 10. Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. I love this. What are Jesus' first two things he says after his resurrection? 
hello, and do not be afraid. So I, I just, sometimes we have this idea of God, right? This distant God, this impersonal God, this, this, this detached God out there. But remember, my friends, Jesus is God, and he is the opposite of detached. He's personal. He's relational. He, he, before getting into what needs to be done, he takes the time to greet these women. He takes the time to comfort their fears and, and encourage them. This is how Matthew portrays Jesus throughout his life and also now in his glorified state. This is the Jesus we worship. And then look at what Jesus does next. He actually gives them the same command that the angel did. This must be important, right? What does it mean to behold the resurrected Jesus? What does it mean to experience Jesus? You need to go and tell. You experience Jesus and you go and tell. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to experience the resurrected Jesus. It's almost the exact same word that the angel used, but there was one significant change. Compare verse 10 to verse 7 with me. In verse 7, the women were commissioned to go and tell who? The disciples. Throughout the, 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 the Matthew, it typically means that's, that's the 11 disciples. But here in verse 10, Jesus changes the command and says to go and tell who? My brothers. Now, it could be a different way of saying it, right? The disciples are his brothers, and now he's personalizing that. That's possible. But as you look through the way that Jesus always uses brothers throughout the Gospel of Matthew, it either refers to his biological family, but it also almost always refers to all his followers. See, the, the idea of who needs to encounter the resurrected Christ, who needs that message, and then who needs to then go and tell? Everybody. Who do we need to go and tell? Everybody. That, that's, that's the message here that they, these women had a new mission for their life that would be defined by going and telling and declaring to everyone the message that Jesus is alive, that he's risen from the dead. See, this gives them an entire new perspective on life, and that gives us an entire new perspective on life. When we are amazed at the resurrection, when we see the historical proof of the resurrection, it should give us a new perspective based on the resurrection. I live in light of the resurrected Savior. My Christian brothers and sisters this morning, Don read from 1 Corinthians 15 that if Jesus has not been raised, that our faith is in vain. But Jesus has been raised. It's a historical fact, which means the opposite is true. Our faith is not in vain. That we follow and love and serve and worship and cherish the resurrected and living Christ. And we, we are in relationship with him. We encounter him through his word. And when we encounter him, the resurrected Lord, through his word, it gives us as well an entirely new perspective on life, a resurrection perspective on life. We can have a resurrection perspective on our jobs and careers. You see, when we go to work tomorrow, it's not just about you. It's not just about how do you get through the day or how do you make your money or how do you put your time in. We work into the resurrected Lord Jesus. We work for him. Right? We adapt his priorities of time and his priorities of finances and his definition of success, which is more based on go and tell than do the grind of the day. Because ultimately, all of our work, all of our daily grind is going to be left unfinished in this life, right? Our, our, our significance is not found in us completing our work in this life because we're all pilgrims and we're waiting to go home with Jesus. And the completion of our work, the fulfillment of our work, the satisfaction of our work is going to be found only in the kingdom, in the resurrection kingdom. We can have a resurrection perspective on family and on parenting and on singleness. That, that, see, wh whatever role that you're in in life, whether you are a, a married or you have children or you are, a, you, you are a child at home or you're a single person, that we're not defined by those roles. We're defined by that we are followers of the resurrected Jesus Christ. I don't see marriage as an opportunity that I get to now have someone serve me. I serve the resurrected Jesus Christ. My marriage is about him. It's not about me. My parenting should be about the resurrected Christ, not about me. If you're a single person, it's not that you get more me time. It's that you have more time to serve that resurrected Christ, right? That, that, that we, don't, we no longer live for ourselves. We live to glorify King Jesus who is alive, and we go and we tell about him. 
we can have a resurrection perspective on suffering. Whether it's illness of a family member, whether it's a bad, bad, uh, bad fall that you take, whether it's a battle with cancer, whether it's uh, even facing the shadow of death. We can pray for God's mercy and healing through those, and we should pray for God's mercy and healing through those. But we recognize our hope is not only in the healing. Our hope is that we have a living Savior who gives us resurrection life as well. Our hope is in his promise. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. Life is worth the living just because he lives. Pastor James Boyce tells a story that in the days of the time prior to electronic communication of 24-hour news reporting, news of great occasion would had to be passed primarily by word of mouth. And so in 19th century England, the people were anxiously awaiting the outcome of the strategic Battle of Waterloo, where the British forces under General Wellington faced off against the French forces of Napoleon. And there was a signalman placed on top of Winchester Cathedral with instructions to always be looking at the sea. And when he received a message, he was to pass it on to a man on the next hill, on the next hill, on the next hill, on the next hill, until it reached London and it spread throughout Britain. At long last, a ship was sighted in the fog, which on that day was thick in the channel, thick fog. And the signalman on board, they saw the, the first word that was signaled. It said, Wellington. And the next word that was signaled was defeated. And then the fog closed in and the ship couldn't be seen. Wellington defeated. And the tragic message was sent throughout England and a great gloom descended over the countryside. After a few hours, the fog lifted and the signal came again, but more clearly this time, Wellington defeated the enemy. That was the full message that came through. And the message went racing through the countryside as people went and told the good news, and the nation rejoiced. You see, at the cross, it seemed like Jesus and all of his followers faced utter defeat and despair. Why would we follow and worship and spend our lives for another dead and buried religious figure? But after three days, the fog lifted, and the full message came through. Jesus defeated the enemy. Jesus did rise from the dead. So that, mean, that means that we can encounter the risen Savior. We can be in, in a relationship with the risen Savior who gives us a whole new perspective on life because he has risen. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. What a glorious truth. And Father, my prayer for us this morning is that it would be more than a fact. Father, my prayer is that it would be more than a, a bit of knowledge, that, Lord, that we would be amazed once again at the risen Lord, that, we'd be, that, 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 that our lives would have a new perspective because he lives, that we would truly face tomorrow because of that truth. So we thank you for that truth. We thank you that you've given us that truth. We thank you that we can hold on to that truth, that he lives. We pray this in Jesus' name.